I welcome you, good weather or bad, hot or cold. We count on this uh, crew to show up. This is the second in our series of discussions with DOD in the ongoing process for um, both soliciting and incorporating industry views and inputs into the, the process for bettering acquisition and saving money along the way, uh, which is underway. And I wanted to welcome not only you all, but those on the phone as well. I believe we have arranged that the phone is broadcast only this morning, so there should be substantially less interference from rustling papers, uh, background noises, uh, barking dogs, and other assorted interferences. None of us in this room, of course, heard any of that, but those who were actually trying to make sense out of this uh, telephonically um, might appreciate that a lot. But what that does mean is you will not be able to, uh, uh, to transmit orally any questions. If you do have comments or questions that you want to submit, uh, you can email them to me at dbertau at csis.org, and, uh, and I will read them and deal with them appropriately, submit them or ignore them as the case may be. Um, I want to welcome Brett Lambert back. Brett, of course, is running this process for DOD. Uh, I believe that both uh, Jim Thompson and, and Katrina McFarlane are en route. Somewhere on 14th uh, Street some, Bridge. Some, yeah. Somewhere on the bridge, uh, uh, probably dealing with the things we've all dealt with the last couple of mornings. And uh, we'll probably get here in time uh, before the thing's over. So uh, without any uh, further comments, uh, Brett, over to you. Uh, and thanks again for everyone. I, I appreciate it. This is really just a status update to, to let you know where we uh, are in the process um, and to re-emphasize the seriousness uh, uh, which the secretary, the deputy secretary uh, uh, who is in, in Guam today uh, and the uh, uh, undersecretary Dr. Carter and Mr. Kendall take this initiative and, and the inputs we're getting. And I have to say, first of all, thank you uh, to industry. We've received, I have a large stack here of of some of it's come through the uh, internet uh, site that we we posted, but a lot of it has come directly to me. And and either way is great. They're being uh, delivered uh, to the the five working groups. I can assure you that there have been several uh, of the comments that are, are working their way through the uh, the internal processes now. And I just wanted to um, share with you a few. Just a reminder of a, a few of the comments. Uh, we were at Farnborough last week with uh, Dr. Carter, and he mentioned um, that there were going to be 16 uh, uh, issues raised in, in, in his uh, deliberation, and that was a bit out of context. So I first want to clarify that. The, the 16 items uh, were, were really a, the, the result uh, of our initial rollout here on June 28th of the areas he wanted to consider. Uh, so let me just briefly reset ourselves on the objectives of, of this effort. The objectives as stated by the Secretary and the Undersecretary are uh, to deliver the warfighter capability we need for the dollars we have. And this is the phrase I've been using, we need to do more without more. Uh, get better buying power for the warfighter and the taxpayer. You don't have to write this down because I have handouts here. Uh, restore affordability to defense goods and services. Improve defense industry productivity. That's where we all come in. Remove government impedance, impedance to leanness. Again, that's where we play a role. Avoid program turbulence and maintain a vibrant and financially healthy defense industrial base. Those are our objectives in this initiative. Uh, I would also point out uh, that there's a key paragraph in Dr. Carter's um, initiative from June 28th, uh, which is in relation to the memo we plan to issue in September, mid-September, uh, as a result of both our internal efforts and uh, the inputs we're getting from industry. And I'll just read this paragraph. The guidance memorandum I plan to issue will require each of you, and this is a memo to the procurement professionals inside the building, will require each of you as you craft and execute the department's contracts in the coming years to scrutinize these terms to ensure that they do not contain inefficiencies or unneeded overhead. The guidance will give you specific features to examine and targets to hit 
in the pursuit of greater efficiency. The guidance will focus on getting better outcomes, not on bureaucratic structures. But it must also take note of where the government's processes and regulations contribute to inefficiency in our business relationships. I will really want to stress that. The inputs we're getting from industry have been very helpful. But I often feel inside the building that we, we shoot ourselves in the foot, we do a study, and I'm looking at one from 1988, uh, we reload and then we shoot ourselves in the other foot. Uh, this is largely, uh, in, in my mind, we have to change internally. And we understand that. And we need your help to give us real, honest suggestions of, of what we can be doing better internally to make the process work better. Uh, so the 16 uh, issues uh, that Dr. Carter mentioned at Farnborough, or the, the topic areas, again, I'm, I'm not going to go through all of them, but you all, if you were here before, had the, the handouts. These 16 uh, questions we're trying to answer have been uh, uh, divided into these five buckets that Jim and Katrina are supposed to talk about here in a second. Uh, um, I'll just I'll, I'll read the headlines. Leveraging real competition, using proper contract vehicles. Now, we're probably going to get a lot of questions about that. Um, uh, using proper contract types for services, aligning policy on profit and fee based on the circumstance, sharing the benefits of cash flow. We understand how important that is. Uh, targeting non-value added costs, involving dynamic small businesses in defense, rewarding excellence in supplier base, adopting should cost and will cost management, strengthening the acquisition workforce, improving our audit system, improving, not increasing, mandating affordability as a requirement, stabilizing production rates, eliminating redundancy within the warfighting portfolios, establishing senior manage, uh, managers for procurement of services, and protecting our technology base. Those are the areas that we're trying desperately to work on. And when we release this directive um, in mid-September, it is our intent, as I've said before, this, this is a marathon. We didn't get here overnight. We're not going to get out of this overnight. Uh, we had a permissive budget environment where it covered a multitude of sins on both industry and government side. We know that. When we had program uh, problems, uh, the pressure we applied to the bleeding was money. We're no longer going to be able to do that. Uh, so we need, all of us need to step up our games, both in industry and in, in the department, and we recognize that. And so we're hoping that this initiative will allow us to have this interchange and interaction with industry to help us do our job better. So. For those of you who um, don't have the June 28th memo, and it was the two of the three attachments to that memo, which include the 16 bullets, it's Ash Carter's 16 items that he mentioned in Farnborough and elsewhere, um, that is available on the DOD website if you look at the press conference that was held at 3 p.m. on June 28th. There's a link that has the, the memo uh, and the attachments uh, there, so you can get all 16 of those items from that. Um, I can just uh, talk a little bit about the process. I'm sorry, Jim. Jim and Katrina uh, obviously are, are here somewhere, but uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the internal process for people who want to know. Again, we're, our goal here is to be as transparent as possible with industry. Uh, you know, as I keep reminding folks, we don't, in the building, despite spending about a billion and a half dollars a day, we don't make anything. Uh, we rely on, on industry uh, to provide the parts and the components uh, to, to make things and to make them work and then sustain them for 20 or 30 years. So industry is a, is a critical component. And I think Dr. Carter, Secretary Lynn, and the Secretary himself have demonstrated their understanding of that fact. Uh, by opening lines of communication both through my office and, and their offices directly. Uh, so we need inputs, we need cooperation, we need to better understand what your, uh, you know, a lot of our program officers, as you know, have never read a P&L. Uh, so we're, we're trying to educate. We have a lot of education to do uh, on the inside. 
uh, but we're, we're going to need work. This is going to have to be a team effort here, and we understand the importance of industry. So as I've said in my office over and over again, I need insight before we dictate oversight. Uh, uh, so we need to make sure we, we are not uh, acting uh, on matters that have unintended consequences. Um, we all know the story of the automobile industry and pushing down margins in the, in the automobile industry, which just went to the second and third tiers, and, and, and we all know how that ended up. So we're going to avoid that uh, in this effort. We are, we are conscious of the effects that any decisions we make have on, on uh, both not just the primes but the second and, and third tiers. So the five groups that uh, Jim and, and Katrina are, are, are heading uh, have been working tirelessly, uh, although is Professor here? Yes, he's here. Where is he? Steve Schooner? Right there. Okay, the so I know you're the skeptic, so good, good. So as a result of your skepticism from the last meeting, I've asked Eugene, who's back there somewhere, who's just joined my uh, staff, Dr. Goulds, um, we're going to convene a, uh, a session of academics outside who don't, aren't related to um, uh, to individual companies, they you know they may have contracts, but they but these are 15. I think Eugene, you came up with 15 of the best and brightest from around the country of people who are concerned about reform, who have been through the 88 reform, who like you have skepticism, uh, and we've scheduled or we're trying to schedule something on the 10th, and and we're uh, in August, and we're hoping that you bring your skepticism. We need to know that. You know, this is a. Um, you know, I, I think that the department will benefit from that kind of interchange. And we just haven't had that interaction. And, and we need to be skeptical because, again, my fear is the unintended consequences. of If we, if we make these actions, if we're, if we're not doing it in an appropriate and effective way, we could, we could make it worse, not better. Uh, so now the, you know, the choices that are on the table are we either get this right between ourselves and industry uh, or somebody else tells us what to do uh, or you know with the European example where you just say you're going to take five percent out of every program which would be devastating uh, so this is our opportunity to get it right and that's how we're viewing it inside the building is to just realize that we are where we are we had a a double digit growth environment at 46 percent I think 46 percent over the last decade it increased in defense funding it covered a lot of sins like I said, on both sides, and now we just need to correct that, and we need to get smarter uh, about how we, uh, how we operate. And that's what this initiative is about, is not taking money away uh, from contractors. It's not taking money away from the services. I think one of the unique features of this uh, effort is that um, all the efficiency savings uh, that will be retained will be retained with inside the services. Uh, we are, you know, this is not uh, a, a budget drill. As we've said, this is not trying to reduce them. It's trying to find greater efficiency uh, inside of what we're doing. So, uh, so for those of you who are skeptics, I encourage that. It's it's a good, it's a good thing to be skeptics. Uh, you know, I'm I, I started this process out. I have to say, as being a, uh, uh, I was, you know, somewhat pessimistic. But the more I have uh, become engaged with the senior leadership, particularly Dr. Carter and Mr. Kendall, uh, the more optimistic I am about their real desire uh, to have benefits. And the comments we have gotten back from industry have been extremely positive. Uh, they're telling us what we need to do to change. And, and we are spinning that out across the five working groups, and they are engaging them. And I would, I, I would hazard to say that you will see a lot of your comments when you put them in. You'll see a lot of your comments um, reflected in the directive that Dr. Carter issues uh, in September. Let me, uh, uh, Brad, if I can, exercise the moderator's prerogative and ask a, a long and complicated, actually it's a simple question, but it has a long and complicated lead-in, uh, if you will. The, the chart that you laid out last week that showed the five issue groups and the, your, your industry working group on one side and the, the service working group on the other side, uh, with uh, Jim and Katrina in the executive director role, sort of implied that the issue groups would be taking input and wrestling with issues both from outside, that is from industry and the inputs that you've alluded to there, as well as from inside the department. 
and then the, they would somehow adjudicate, moderate, integrate, et cetera, those, and the executive directors themselves had some of that integrating function because, as was noted in some of the questions last week, there are issues that clearly span across the issue groups and would touch more than one, in some cases three or four, maybe even all five of the issue groups. Um, is that an accurate reflection of what's happening, and how is that done in real time? Right. Well, it, um, so we, we are getting inputs, and we have, as, uh, if you go to our website, you'll see the form. And some people are filling out the forms. Others are just deciding to send me directly uh, suggestions. Either one is, is fine. We, we then, uh, uh, the process is we categorize and bucket them, and then I go uh, to Jim and Katrina and, and talk about which buckets they should go into. And, and as you've said, some of the suggestions we've been getting, uh, some are coming from associations, uh, uh, some are coming from individual companies, and some are coming from individuals. Uh, and some are very specific, DFAR 9.44, you know, needs to be checked, which is fine. And then we determine which of the organizations, which buckets they need to go into, and then um, as they do their meetings, where my office uh, participates in, in their internal meetings, um, uh, to make sure that industry is being represented in the uh, uh, in those discussions, and and then when they're out briefed, the process is when they're out briefed to Mr. Kendall and Dr. Carter, and eventually uh, 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 Deputy Secretary Lynn, um, that the industry inputs are reflected. Now, I will say that some of the industry inputs we've received are what I would call the the part of the back end of the marathon. Uh, you know, I'm trying to take milepost one. What what can we change immediately that, that needs to change uh, or needs to we, where we have effect? Um, it doesn't mean that the other suggestions. I, I'd probably say half of the suggestions we've received so far have been more systemic changes that we need to make internally uh, to the department and the process. Those are not going to be dismissed. There will be a lot of follow-on effort. Dr. Carter's. Uh, concept, which I think is solid, is that we will make uh, these recommendations to um, to the uh, procurement executives in September uh, on new programs. New program starts. Uh, you know, this is how you should be. You know, you should be looking at these things as you do new programs. But then, you know, toward the end of the year, the calendar year, he'll ask for accountability. I think uh, one of our groups, uh, four, I think, is the group has the largest challenge uh, of anyone, which is documenting accountability. You know, how do we know we've improved anything? And that's, that's a huge challenge uh, internal to the building. So, so there will be a follow-on effort to this. This is, again, it's, it's a marathon, not a sprint. So the sprint will be the September guidance, but then there will be a significant amount of follow-on uh, from, that, from that effort. Well, let me ask a follow-on question then. Um, you know, the service palms are essentially due to OSD, I believe, at the end of this week, 30th of July. Yeah, I have them here. And uh, you have no, them? No, okay, good. Um, and, and I know from conversations with the military departments, they've been wrestling heavily with uh, implementing and reflecting in their own, in their own uh, palms uh, the, the initiatives that the Secretary gave them in his guidance of June 4th, which implemented his, his uh, Eisenhower uh, speech back in May. It's obviously fair to say that those inputs will not reflect the deliberations you just described, since the issue groups are just getting started and have just wrestled through that. So the, the, they've come to their own conclusions on this broader set of, I believe the Gates memo refers to it as efficiencies initiative, plural efficiencies. I tend to think of it as efficiency as an overall objective, so I haven't figured out whether I have a, a singular or a plural in my own mind here. Uh, but how do you meld those two together over the next uh, month and a half? That is, the, the review of the service palms and their initiatives uh, with the work of the issue groups as it folds forward into DOD. Well, again, I think this is um, part of the effort that we're, we're engaged with industry on is, is about looking forward. So, the, you know, we're locking down palm, as you indicated. But we're, when uh, Dr. Carter has articulated uh, specific programs, where he would like to see whatever initiatives come out in, in mid-September, whatever we indicate uh, uh, or guidance that he gives to procurement officials. And this will, again, be a document that's about guidance. Um, 
it will be about uh, new programs, new contract activities. So you can imagine uh, the programs in mind. These, this is not about trying to uh, correct uh, past mistakes, although we will be guided by those mistakes uh, and the anecdotes and a lot of the, you know, the uh, documents and input we're getting are you guys really messed up and uh, uh, you could have saved a lot of money if you had just done this. Well, that's helpful, uh, but it's like writing a report that's what I often find in my office we do, which is it may be of historical interest that. Uh, uh, so we're looking forward. So we're looking at what, what programs are we, and we have some big programs coming up. I know everyone says we have no major program initiatives, but we have Ohio class replacement. We have uh, 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 new blocks on JSA. We, there are a lot of programs that are coming up where we can apply this discipline, uh, this new effort on efficiencies, and that's what we'll be concentrating on. So it's right. not uh, specifically, again, I go back to it's not a budget drill. It's about us trying to be better at what we do and getting industry to be aligned in rewards uh, and incentives with what we do uh, and getting everyone rowing in the same direction because if we don't row in the same direction, somebody's going to tell us what to do, and we want to avoid that. All right. Um, let me open the floor up for, for questions now. Uh, and you just to remind you of our procedure, uh, wait for the microphone, uh, stand up, speak into the microphone, identify yourself and your affiliation, and then you may offer your question, comment, or reaction. Um, all right. Uh, I know that Ralph Nash is champing at the bit already. Um, so while the microphone is, is winding through, I'll, I'll mention the 1988 study that, uh, to, to, which Mr. Lambert referred to earlier. Uh, there's actually a couple people in this room who worked on it. Uh, this was uh, incentivizing industry for better performance, and you'll recognize some of the names of the folks who uh, wrote that I have report. it here. It's mimeographed. Yes, it's it, really it impressive. It is not available electronically except in scanned PDF file, but it was uh, Bob Moore, Chuck Henry, uh, Tony Maleo, um, Bill Federacho, <laughs> and one other whose name I don't recall right now. So ah, the microphone was not on. Let me just introduce. So these are our, the, the Fort House, 14th Street, Third. Good. No. <laughs> so we're all. I don't know how many people here are without power. So yeah. So I've, I've spent two days now without power. So when I was trying to get ready for this last night, my my kids helped me. I just want to show a prop here. I was trying to tell them what I was going to talk about today. So they they helped me. This is me. This is what I'm supposed to talk about, and these are the, the shiny items that we're supposed to, this is the good news thing at the end of the day. So anyway, it goes on and on, but this is all we could do in candles, so. Uh, but I appreciate you guys for, for making it, uh, and I won't say that this is their second full-time job anymore, so you've, you've corrected me of, of that, but uh, we just went over kind of the process where we are. If you would just spend just a, a second talking about kind of uh, individual, you know, the five groups and, and the process, and then we'll just go to questions. And So, uh, it's been, I guess, a couple weeks, and we have approximately 30 full-time uh, people who have reached into additional staff inside of the services and agencies, and we are working very diligently on issues. In fact, on Friday, we, will t we were able to take one issue forward to Dr. Carter, to expressly uh, ask, is this the granularity you need uh, for your ability to make the appropriate decisions? And he said yes. So now we have a template so we know what the product will look like. Um, we have uh, a lot of very, very good uh, input coming in, and uh, I have to say we're very fortunate that these folks that we have on this team are experienced and know exactly how to collect data and how to express it and to also formulate good alternatives that uh, we can uh, deliberate on. And that is essentially where we're at. We've got a lot of uh, work in front of us. Um, we've just been sitting in the car over here, and by the way, I don't envy your traffic. I thought it was bad on the other side of the water. My goodness. Um, 
but uh, on the ride over here, we went through the calendar, realizing that there's pretty much no airspace left on it, trying to find <laughs> opportunity to add some additional interest items to the table. And that's pretty much a top level, unless you have anything you'd like to add. Maybe just to, just to add a couple of quick things. Um, Dr. Carter had signed out a letter, you know, back on 28 uh, June that, that had a number of things in it that, that really uh, gives us, a, to be blunt, a really running start. I mean, there are a number of things in there that we're starting with to take a look at and to, and to flesh out. So uh, we're not starting from a completely clean sheet of paper. Uh, we've got a number of things that, that, uh, that he's already articulated that he would like to, uh, our group to take a look at, so we're doing that. Uh, the other thing, just as Katrina said, you know, our op tempo here is uh, actually she and I meet uh, about uh, either three or four times a week, uh, depending on pretty much every day, depending on whether or not we're having a team leadership meeting. And then we meet with them uh, extensively uh, two to three hours each week to go through where they're at. So that's really the, the tempo we're on. So we've already, we're already off and running in the last two weeks to, to get the ideas fleshed out. Uh, the other thing that uh, I would encourage you all to do, if, if Brett hasn't already emphasized this, um, we need fact-based, data-based uh, ideas. Uh, the, 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 you know, the, the time, time for anecdotes and those kind of things have been made clear to Ms. McFarland and I from Dr. Carter. We're not doing that uh, for this drill. We really need fact-based uh, information and ideas and adjustments in the policies, procedures, and practices and behaviors. So that's really what our team is, is focused on, is getting the facts right, uh, getting the data to support those facts, and then making the recommended adjustments in the policies and procedures and practices and the things that we want to carry forward. So I would just ask you, as you think about uh, submitting ideas or adjustments in our thinking, that you do it with as much fact-based information as, as you can. That would certainly help us. Yes. Yeah. I, I, you know, as I said earlier, we're getting, you know, we, we have a large mix. We're getting, uh, uh, I have yet to get the, uh, the comment that I was expecting, which is if you just sell, you know, sell off the aliens in Area 51, you could reduce the deficit. So we're getting actually better uh, uh, things th than that. But uh, to, to Jim's point, it, 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 the more fact-based it can be, the better it is for us, uh, and the more helpful it is, and the more useful it will be in our deliberations. So. And, and then maybe one, one thing worth uh, stating again <clears throat> is Dr. Carter has made it clear to our teams that, uh, uh, you know, this is not a budget drill. The, the effort that we are in is really looking at those changes and adjustments and the, and the way we do business, and then we'll look to, to have those ideas and those initiatives undergird and support uh, uh, looking at adjusting budgets from tail to tooth as, as we go forward. But our job is really not to go find specifically X numbers of billions of dollars. Our job is to really look at, again, what are those policies, procedures, maybe even ledge props that we need to consider uh, going, going forward. So I just, that, that certainly keeps our mind off of the other piece and keeps our mind very much on what we can, what we can really get our hands on and adjust and change. Yeah, I just, I, I had only one thing. I've been in all these meetings uh, with, with these guys and, and the, and the undersecretary and the deputy secretary. This is, this is not about how we find money within programs to cut. Uh, and that's, you know, this is about uh, how we do things better. And I just can't stress that enough. Uh, this is about how we do things that we are doing now, how we just do them better. One of the most remarkable things that the teams have discovered is that pretty much all of the guidance and policy exists already and has gone through the process and has been approved and has been legislated and has been authorized. The fact is we do not necessarily comply with it. Uh, it we may comply with it at a margin. We may comply with it at, uh, at the intent level, but we have not investigated the full details. Most of these activities that we're looking at have a spectrum of, of, of opportunity that you can take advantage of as a tool when you're out there working together. Uh, and so one of the things that we're targeting is where within that spectrum, you know, from one end to another, is the best place for us to look at doing the business better. So understanding the intent of the guidance that's out there and understanding the policies and what they were written and scribed to be 
what are we doing that we can do better to effectively meet that intent rather than taking the most expedient or the simplest route out. And so most of what we have found, uh, in fact, the detailed example that I was referencing earlier with the granularity, it had literally the reference, I think it was 10 uh, policies and governance and laws that existed today that would allow or already <coughs> were in place to do this work. So it's not, uh, you know, I hate to say this from my position, but uh, rocket science, but it is essentially really understanding what the intent of these policies and procedures were and implementing them appropriate to the work that's in hand rather than taking the most expedient route forward. Mr. Nash, do you still have a question or has it uh, now been uh, adequately uh, addressed? You, you do here still have the mic, okay. Okay. All right. I'm I'm uh, an old academic skeptic. I I started out on the uh, I started out on the uh, yeah. This is the young one here. Uh, Which one? I read wrote in my newsletter. I call it a memory loss because if there ever was a program that should have been done as a, a competitive prototyping program, that was it. And you ran a big paper competition. If you'd done that program right, you'd be flying tankers now down our Eddie testing. Uh, and I just wrote up an army program where they did competitive prototyping a thousand. Competitive prototyping for the uh, test articles, and then they're going to award a single contract for a thousand. They're not going to run competition. You, you love paper competitions. You don't like real competition between real products. And you, that's what drives me up the wall. Is you want to, you know, there's a lot of success out there, but it's all forgotten. <laughs> Of course, I won't comment on the ongoing efforts, but you, when you said locked into this initiative, into these, th I'm, I'm confused as to what you meant by that. Well, these narrow things are, the, are on this list. Yeah. Um, you don't think they're broad enough? Well, requirements is even on the list. Well, requirements is uh, well, well, it's part, of, it's the part of the portability. So. You could, uh, no, I, but anyway, I just was. I mean, these are <laughs> these are these are all old. Alan Shavatkin asked the question last time. These are all things we've been talking about for fifty years. Right. There's nothing new here. 
And you're not going to improve the system by uh, playing around with types of contracts. You're going to do more harm than good with types of contracts because you're going to suck people into fixed price contracts when they shouldn't have them. Uh, I don't know what you're going to do about profit, but I don't think that's a big issue. Uh, you know, competition, nobody knows what, you don't know what a real competition is. As I said, you like paper competitions. You like, came out on the internet last week, it cost uh, Airbus $75,000 just to print the proposal, printing costs. Euros or dollars? <laughs> I don't know if it was euros no. or dollars. It said dollars, but I asked the same question. Might have been euros. But it's all, it. Well, I hope you'll join us uh, for the lunch on the 10th because this is the kind of feedback we have. But I, I, I do think that there is a difference uh, in that. Um, I, I take your point on competitive prototyping because that's come up in a bunch of the suggestions we've, we've uh, had from industry. So that, that I think is, uh, and going back and looking, and I recall the GAO uh, study that was done on successful programs, whether it's Sidewinder or A10. And, uh, uh, you know, again, for this exercise, I mean, I, I think one of the, issues we face, and I think these guys particularly have been faced with, is that uh, uh, we understand, everyone agrees on industry and in, in the inside the building, uh, the general parameters of what needs to change. And so when there's an initiative like this, there is, a, is an incredible amount of pressure on that individual initiative to solve all the world's problems and, and to make things right. Uh, but we are not starting with a clean slate, or in my old world, a clean whiteboard. We have to work with legacy systems, and we have to think forward, not backward. And so we, this initiative is not going to make everyone happy. In fact, it's probably going to make some people upset. Uh, but we are trying to do what's in the interest of the department, and I think the taxpayer, uh, and if we can get um, a 10 percent you know, effective rate here. I will look at it as I did in my previous life in industry is this is a turn organization and you don't turn organizations quickly. Uh, it takes time. And so we just have to make the right steps and what we have to ensure, and that's where we're, we're going to need people like you, your help, is that we're not doing things that have unintended consequences that make things worse rather than better. Uh, but that's why we're trying to have this, this dialogue and this outreach. If I could offer, there was something that I think is important to answer to that question. Um, one of the things that we have been challenged um, in our teams are, is how do you take effectively what is obviously information that's been made available to the department for a long time and make sure it's implemented? And that's the question of follow through. And what uh, we've been working on is a path that we're calling it enablers. Um, what are your steps that you take to enable the action and the intended consequences that you're desiring to be effectively put into the process and carried through? And we haven't come up with a final answer to it, but we've uh, postured things such as we're going to take programs, uh, go to the services, pick specific programs, and literally walk through the entire balance of the life cycle on that program with these initiatives imposed I'm using a bad term, but imposed on them. Uh, the, uh, there's several effects that that brings. Uh, it brings education, mentoring. It shows the process and how it's done. It allows for people to understand in an open forum critical thinking. Uh, it, it's intended to be done for all the services. So there's, uh, there's an, let's be plain speaking here, we all understand the resources, the human resources in the government uh, in a specific, this time frame when we're going to go through uh, uh, an economic climate that we have that we're dealing with. We have to have our side grow, our government side grow, so we're a better partner and a better customer to industry. So that education process is critical in order to have success. And we have a youthful community and we have a lot of folks that uh, are going to have to go through that process of learning by hands-on. And so there is a natural progression of tasks that have to happen post this initiative that follow through on the desired outcomes that we're tabling, that we're going to engage in, just so you have a sense of what we're intending to do. 
I have on my list for questions, I've got uh, Bill, I've got Cord, and then I've got Steve. So let's start uh, with Bill here. And if you want to catch my eye um, for a question, I'll put you on the list here. Yeah, there's, you know, it's it's uh, it's like any household when the budget gets tighter, everyone looks for coupons, so everyone's out there doing initiatives. Our initiative's not focused on a dollar amount; it's focused on a. Uh, uh, this initiative is on the t two to three percent of what we spend uh, in in acquisition from from an AT and L perspective a year, and trying to wring out efficiencies there. So there are ongoing efficiencies. This uh, our effort is not. Uh, related to any uh, uh, sizing in terms of the overall, uh, and I know that was mentioned in troop strength and whatnot. We're we're not doing that. We're 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 solely focused on the about 400 billion dollars a year or so that we spend on um, uh, on uh, procurement on investment accounts uh, and what we we do with that. And I don't think we've had any guidance to look at anything else. So. There are other people looking at other things, but this is our focus. And we were all asked to write checks for 100 billion uh, and not date them, and we've given them in to the secretary. So no, no, we're not. We're not being asked to. Uh, we haven't been asked to hit a specific target. We've just asked. We've been asked a very simple question, which is, how do we do what we're doing now better? How do we get more without more? And there is no dollar amount tied to it. Again, this is not a budget drill. We're not trying to find numbers. We're trying to find efficiency. I will add that I, I, this is just my personal comment on this would be that uh, I think many in the building would say that, you know, it's going to be hard to find those kind of numbers unless we fundamentally go back and, and relook at, uh, you know, notwithstanding the, the comments earlier about we've been there before, but without fundamentally going back and asking ourselves, where can we get back to first principles that are already there? Where have we gone off the rails a little bit? Uh, without that, we're not going to be able to achieve numbers anyway uh, that we re that's, being, that's really being pressed, uh, pressed down on the services. So I think uh, even though the services and, and everyone is out looking, apart from this effort, where they can find uh, specific savings, uh, this effort instead has really looked at what do we need to do to to really adjust again the practices and the behaviors and procedures that we can do. We can affect those things. We're just going to have to go in and dial them in very specifically to get back to first principles. And I'll go back as an example on prototyping. Uh, there's probably no other person that, that I know in my sphere that's as passionate about prototyping in general. Competitive prototyping is a very specific item in prototyping. But to me, that's a first principle argument, you know? It's first principles. Uh, so our question should be to ourselves, and we're asking this among our teams, uh, where is it that we have uh, allowed ourselves not to prototype, whether it's competitive prototyping or whether it's prototyping within industry, government teams? I mean, it's just a fundamental first principle. So we're, we need to go back and ask ourselves, you know, why is it that we don't see that practiced as much, whether it's a radar or whether it's a, an, a, an aircraft or an unmanned aircraft? Uh, why is it we don't see as much of that today? Where have we become unpracticed at that is a rhetorical question we want to ask ourselves. And to me, those are the first principle things we're asking our teams to come back and look at so that regardless of what the number is going to be in the future, that we at least have an opportunity to, to, to pursue those numbers. But without some fundamental adjustments in the way we're uh, looking at our first principles in engineering and first principles in program management, I think we're going to be hard-pressed to get there. 
Um, in the back of the room on my right. Cord Sterling with AIA. A number of the things that you're looking at are internal to the department, processes that you can fix, and we, there's no doubt about that. But there's still a lot of things that are imposed upon the department and on industry by Congress. There's a tremendous number of those government unique clauses. We've had staff tell us they don't care about the cost of them, it's about the policy, the principle. To what extent are you, or as a secretary, willing to take on Congress on these issues? I think of things such as the 3% tax withhold, which the department estimated had cost it $17 billion over a five-year period. Whether that number is accurate or not, we know it's several billion. But there's a number of other that are really uh, clauses that Congress has imposed on DOD, has imposed on industry that are driving up costs. Is the secretary willing to take on the Congress on this issue, really push for these changes that would allow us to reduce our costs by reducing these mandates? Well, I'd, I'd say we, tr we try never to use the word take on and Congress in the same sentence uh, ever. Uh, I don't think it's a, you know, I, I just don't think it's a question of taking on somebody or, or con we need to do the right thing. You know, if we do the right thing, I think reasoned people will, will respond in kind. And that's the direction we've been given is to do the right thing, do what makes sense. If I were running a business, I wouldn't run it the way we're running our business. I'd change it. Uh, and that's what we've been asked to do. We're trying to change it. It's going to take cooperation of our suppliers and our industrial base, and it's going to take cooperation of the people who pay the bill, which is ultimately the Congress. But we need to focus on doing the right thing, not trying to please uh, people. And I think, um, if anything, the Secretary has demonstrated his willingness to do the right thing and not necessarily worry about the the political fallout from that. Um, down in the front row, we've got two. Uh, Steve, if you would just pass it over to Bill Tuttle when you're finished, that would be fine. Thanks. Um, I just want to briefly start with Katrina's point because I think it's so tremendously important. You know, there's reform and then there's implementation. And realistically, if you want to go back and look at the data and the experience, DOD has either been gutting or underinvesting its, in its acquisition workforce since 1989, okay? At the end of the day, that's where a lot of your efficiencies come from. If you're talking about, you know, how these things are going to change, I mean, there's a lot of people who think that Shea Assad, Frank Anderson have been partners in all this, and at the end of the day, if you're really going to get any kind of improvements, you're going to have to do it with people implementing existing policies. And you can rewrite the rules all you want, but that's all about people. You don't have the people, and it's going to take you a generation to fix it. So let's be honest about that. Okay. Um, you know, Brett, I appreciate the fact that it's easy to say that I was the skeptic at the last meeting, and I'm ecstatic that Eugene's going to host the academics in another week. But as I mentioned to Matisse when I walked in, we walked out of here on Thursday, and a significant number of the people in this room all flew to Florida, the National Contract Management Association, World Congress. And whether you like it or not, this was what we talked about all week. And every discussion we had on everything came back to this. And so let me just offer you a few observations that we kept hearing time and time again last week. I think the first one, you keep telling us that you want fact-based input, but you keep talking about fixed price contracts, and frankly, what we're hearing is profit caps. There are generations of empirical evidence that demonstrate that what fixed price contracts buy Inappropriate, in inappropriate situations are failure and litigation, and it's not what you want. We can go all the way back to the Renegotiation Act and the rationales that killed the Renegotiation Act, but the one good thing about the Renegotiation Act was it reflected that if you made too much profit on one contract, whatever the hell that meant, if you lost money on another contract, it was the contractor's overall profitability that mattered. Profit caps are doomed to fail, and if you're going that route, then we're not really having an intelligent conversation. Um, second, there's a lot of anxiety about the note in the Carter memo that talks about cash flow and sharing the benefits of cash flow. And I think it's imperative that you all keep in mind, and I think you know this, that you can't squeeze the contractors on the time value of money. There is a significant trade-off in the industry, and Wall Street has reflected it for years. Defense contractors make relatively less profit they take, in many ways, more and different types of risk. But they do that because they have consistent, reliable cash flow. If you mess with that, if you try to squeeze that as a saving, 
then you're upsetting the apple cart in extremely significant ways. Okay, just a couple other quick things. And I think Cord already opened the door on this. If you really want to talk about more competition, if you really want to talk about getting the inefficiencies out of the system, let's talk about FAR Part 19, FAR Part 25, and FAR Part 37. But the reality is you're not going to do it, you can't go to war with con Congress, and you're not going to win. But that's where the game becomes inefficient. That's where the lion's share of your regulation, your training, your implementation, and your workforce energy gets squandered. That's where you could get major improvements. You're just not going to get them. The last thing, I just want to go back to the same thing that I started with when we talked on, I think it was the 15th. It's all about requirements. Anybody that you talk to, anybody who's done research, you're going to have to decide what you don't want to pay for anymore. And that's where the real savings are going to come from. That's a leadership issue. It's at the highest levels of the Defense Department and the Congress. But the most frustrating thing about that is the requirements decision. What you can do without is not an acquisition function. And you can squeeze acquisition all you want, but people are going to have to make really hard decisions about what you can live without. And that's where the savings are going to come from. I agree with your last point. Well, this is sort of a follow-on question, uh, accidentally, but that's uh, that's all right. I, I'm sorry, Bill Tuttle. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm my affiliation today, I guess, is DAU Board of Visitors, because I'm really. My question is: Have you have you got DAU involved in this, in terms of because this the message out that you want to send, Ms. McFarland, to the workforce is is use the authority you have and use it intelligently, make business type decisions. And that's, that's a continual training problem. But I think that's, that, that will be important because there's 100, over 100,000 a year that DAU reaches out and touches. And this is a marvelous way to transmit the message of the need for efficiencies, what it means, keep it up to date. So if you're doing that, that's, you, you've answered my question. Thanks. Yeah, I just say that they've been intimately involved. I mean, this, this, the whole point of this, I mean, when, when we rolled out this initiative, the secretary gave his speech in uh, Abilene, which is in the state of the great state of Kansas. Uh, and, uh, and then when Dr. Carter rolled out this initiative on the 28th, we made a point of coming here to CSIS first to reach out to industry. They were gracious hosts. Um, and then we uh, went directly from there to uh, NDU to meet with, I think, I don't know how many hundreds of uh, uh, our contract professionals to give them the same message that this was coming and then the secretary himself um, met with Dr. Carter for a press release that afternoon. So uh, they are critical. Uh, we need a level playing field. I've seen it on the other side in my industry experience that, you know, we, we, have to, we have to step up our game in terms of our negotiating capabilities and, and, and knowledge uh, from you know, we, we are the, we're the buyers, and we just need to do a better job of that. And I think everyone is, is very aware uh, inside the building that we need to do better. Any other questions uh, as we look out over the room here? I've gotten none uh, in by email either. So um, you guys want to wrap up your concluding remarks? And then, uh, by the way, the traffic is just as bad going the other way. Um, just different people, those who have given up and gone back uh, <laughs> along the way. No, I just say, you know, I, I, think, I think there's, I, 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 I don't mean to characterize you as a skeptic, but there, there's skepticism about this, and, and I understand that. I, I think uh, uh, in, in my personal role, I was uh, 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 somewhat of a, I've been in industry, so I understand what these initiatives think, but I think it was to Jim's point, this, is about, this initiative is about first principles. Uh, how do we do things better with what we have? And it's not about cutting budgets. It's not about saying we want fewer of this or more of that. It's about how do we all get on the same page and start rowing in the same direction, industry and the government. It's a lot, it's going to be, frankly, a lot more work on our end inside the building, I think. I mean, um, uh, I find that industry tends to respond when we give them clear direction. We just need to give them clear direction of where we're going. And I think that's will hopefully be part of these directives and this initiative that comes out and these guys are working uh, hard on giving that direction. But the direction is not a fait accompli. The, the, the directive that comes out in September will not be the end of it. Uh, it will be the beginning of it. Uh, and it's a long process and it's going to take years and it will go into the, you know, I know the 
palms closed, the fit is closed, all of that's closed. This is going to go on for a long time. It's just we're trying to course correct here for a new world that we find ourselves in. As Dr. Carter says, we're not in the, uh, the peace dividend uh, of the, uh, 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 that we had before, and we're certainly not in the 46 percent or, or compounded double-digit annual growth uh, that we've had in the last decade. We're, we're, in, we're somewhere in between, and we're trying to sort our way through that, and part of it, part of that, will be being more efficient about the way we buy things so that we can ensure and we can say with a straight face to the taxpayer that we're spending their dollars wisely. On behalf of CSIS, I want to thank you all for coming, for participating. Um, our session three of this series will be in mid-August. Um, we'll be sending out a, a save the date announcement shortly. Um, I think that I'm we will. Hoping the power will be back on. By then. Pa power should be back on at, at most Pepco homes by uh, mid-August. They may have gone off again, but uh, uh, the uh, uh, CSIS will also continue to wrestle with ways to help DoD as as they overcome the skepticism and the weight of 50 years of uh, success here. So <laughs> thank you all and appreciate your continued support.